To continue our discussion on the biggest issue of the day, where do we go next with the Affordable Care Act? We have a panel here of experts, thought leaders with unique perspectives on the health care law and ways to build on it and how we fix what isn't working actually in the health insurance market today. Um, before we get started, Kevin Cunahan had a emergency first thing this morning and actually had to fly back to DC um, from Dallas. So Dr. Aaron Carroll was gracious enough to join us for the panel. So since I've already introduced him, I'm going to skip that introduction over again and introduce the rest of our panel. Um, Ovik Roy, sitting right next to me, joins us from the heels of a very busy presidential campaign season where he served as the policy advisor to Marco Rubio. Ovik also previously advised Rick Perry and Mitt Romney during their presidential run. He is the president of the Foundation for the Research on Equal Opportunity, a nonpartisan, nonprofit think tank that conducts original research on expanding opportunity to those who least have it. He's also an opinion editor at Forbes, where he writes politics and policy manages the Apothecary, Forbes blog on healthcare policy and entitlement reform. He's also a frequent commentator on network and cable news and previously served as the senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute where he conducted research on the ACA and other health related topics. Thank you, Ovik, for joining us. Bruce Jabson, down on the end, um, joins us from the Windy City where he's in the trenches daily writing about the intricacies of healthcare and the health insurance for Forbes. He's the author of Inside Obamacare, The Fix for America's Ailing Healthcare System. He's a regular analyst on Fox News Channel, Forbes on Fox, and several news radio outlets. His work has appeared in the New York Times, The Motley Fool, and Chicago Medicine, and he teaches for the University of Iowa School of Journalism. Congrats on the Cubs win. <laughs> Bruce, and thank you for joining us. Um, Ken Yonda, one of our member CEOs, brings another unique perspective for us. He's the president and CEO of Community Health Choice, a THP Health Plan member and Houston-based managed care organization that provides managed care plan, uh, managed health care plan focused on low-income families, including Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program, and participates in the marketplace on the exchange. Ken is a regular contributor to the Houston Chronicle and has over 30 years of experience in the managed care industry. Prior to joining the community in 2008, he served as Houston Market President for Humana, following leadership positions with both Aetna and Prudential Healthcare in Houston and other markets. Thank you, Ken. So of course, with this panel too, all of our questions changed after Tuesday. I think everybody had to change all of their presentations for the week. <laughs> but it also made our panel much more interesting. So a lot, not a lot's clear, of course, and Dr. Carroll pointed this out this morning on what's going to happen or what the ACA is going to look at. Mitch McConnell, the majority leader, has confirmed that repealing and replacing the ACA is of course the first priority for the new year. It's a favorite campaign slogan for Republicans, but do we really know what it looks like? Can, uh, you know, this is a question for all of you, but what all proposals are you seeing? Are there any meat on the bones of these proposals? And do you have any idea what an alternative would really look like? I think Dr. Carroll has presented on that some, so we might have OVIC start on this. Uh, so let me plug the 100-page health reform plan uh, that my new think tank recently published at you can find it at freeop.org, that's F-R-E-O-P-P dot O-R-G. If you just scroll down and you click on the link that says Transcending Obamacare, um, it'll, there'll be an article and then there's a, a link to the full report. Uh, and that report covers everything from the ACA to Medicare to Medicaid to the VA to uh, uh, prescription drug prices, digital health, uh, hospital consolidation. It's, it's pretty wide ranging. Um, and it focuses on the goal of achieving universal coverage from a market-based uh, perspective. And, 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 the, and the reason why uh, that is, uh, you know, coincidentally attuned to this moment, is you know, we heard from Aaron earlier that, well, we don't really don't know what Donald Trump thinks about healthcare. Actually, you know, when it comes to the, the very, very detailed wonky regulations, uh, maybe that's true, but in terms of the core principles that Donald Trump has articulated, he's been actually surprisingly consistent. So for, uh, a decade and a half, if not longer, he's been an advocate for universal coverage. In his book, The Art of the Deal in 2000, he said, look, I'm a conservative on most things, but I'm a liberal on one thing. I support universal coverage. He reiterated that last year in an interview with 60 Minutes. I want everybody to have health coverage. 
Uh, and when Scott Pelley asked him, well, how do you do that? He said, well, the government's going to pay for it for the people who need financial assistance. So these are things he's been saying for a very long time. He has also said consistently over the last several years that he thinks Obamacare is a disaster and that it needs to be repealed and replaced. And I know that there's a group of, there's a cohort of people in America who assume that if you want to repeal and replace Obamacare, you must hate the uninsured and want them all to die. But it is possible to support universal coverage and want to do it in a different way that the Affordable Care Act does it. And um, that's the central uh, thesis behind uh, transcending Obamacare, uh, the, the white paper I just referred to. So what does it actually do? Um, I'll try to very, it's, it's 100 pages, so I'll try to simplify it. But the basic idea is to gradually, over a, a, a fairly long period of time, move more and more people into private coverage in which the federal government is not micromanaging how those plans must be designed, but letting patients, consumers, and state regulators determine what's the best approach for the insurance markets in those states, and making sure that there's robust financial assistance for the people who need it. That means lower income people and the sick and the disabled, etc. So the idea is let's make sure that there's financial assistance for the people who need it, but be as minimally prescriptive as possible to achieve that goal. And a lot of what you have to do to get there is to take this gamish of subsidy programs that we have in the United States uh, and move them in a more means-tested direction. So right now, we spend $800 billion a year, plus or minus, subsidizing health coverage for old people. We spend about $500 billion a year through the tax code subsidizing health coverage for employed people. And then we spend about $500 billion a year on Medicaid and maybe a, you know, another 50 to $100 billion a year on the ACA-sponsored approaches. So we spend way more money subsidizing health coverage for upper-income people than we do for lower-income people. We spend way more money subsidizing coverage for people who've had their lives, their entire life, professional lives to save uh, for their health care, and we spend very little subsidizing coverage for people with very low net worth. Uh, so a lot of what Transcending Obamacare tries to do is move to a more uh, patient-centered system where individuals are choosing their own health care plans, uh, a minimally prescriptive system so that individuals have freedom to choose the plans that are right for them, and a system in which we're devoting our scarce resources at the federal and state levels to the people who most need the help and not the people who least need the help. Would you like to follow up, or Bruce? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, and go. And I, I think, as uh, Dr. Carroll said earlier, uh, we're all just kidding ourselves if we know exactly what's going to happen next. And, but since there, uh, it's not clear what is going to happen next, we might as well go with what we want to have happen next, right? So, uh, so, so the way I, I think about this is, is actually because I am a, a huge baseball fan and uh, thrilled that the Cubs won, even though I'm worried that perhaps the Cubs winning may have upset the vortexes and, and caused uh, the whole world to, to change last, last Tuesday. We'll take it back. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, I think of it as, as sort of running the four bases. And, and the first thing is, is I always start with personal accountability. You know, it's, it's my responsibility to take care of my own health and my own health care needs. And I want to have choices. I want to have choices of doctors and hospitals. Uh, I want to have choices other than going to the emergency room when I need care in the middle of the night. That would be really great if we had different kind of choices. But it's my accountability, including my accountability to pay for my health insurance or my health insurance needs. So I always start with personal accountability. And the second thing that we have to do is cover everybody because, as I'll explain in a minute, you can't get to home plate without first having everybody in the system. And the mess that we have right now of different uh, you know, people being uninsured and Texas not doing the Medicaid expansion, which you know, makes no sense to me at all, either economically or to help people's health outcomes. Those kind of, we need to get everybody insured. So I'm a big supporter of, of universal coverage. The third thing is to consolidate the confusing funding streams that we have right now. And that is, as an insurance company that deals with a lot of safety net providers, where you have FQHCs that have 25 different sources of revenue depending on who their patient is and that you have Medicaid funding here and subsidies there the whole employer-sponsored uh, subsidies it's very very confusing so anything that we do should be to try to simplify the funding streams 
And by covering everybody and simplifying the funding streams, you then have the fourth thing, and getting to home plate for me is really about how do you bend trend. When Dr. Carroll showed that curve of the expenses just going up and up and up, it's really about what are we doing with reforming the way care is delivered right now, and what are we doing to move away from a fee-for-service environment that encourages more utilization of services, and in our case, making a, a fairly significant bet on integrated health networks and how we can actually tell people, and I tell my staff all the time, we should have, our goal should be zero trend for the rest of our life. You know, we need to flatline how much we pay per capita, and that's really the, the magic sauce that I think we in this room can really do something about, is how do we work with doctors and hospitals differently to think differently about how much care we get, how much we pay for that care, what are the trade-offs in that will improve outcomes but actually save money at the same time. I don't totally agree with your uh, iron triangle. I, I have this, this idea that you can actually improve outcomes and save money at the same time. So, oh, okay, go ahead. <clears throat> okay. I mean, I, I, I don't want to take your time on that. So what is I think that the problem with that is that, you know, often when people say, oh, I can do it, is that what you don't realize is what you're taking away is somebody else's access or quality. Like, I would have no problem tomorrow if we said, we shouldn't pay for stuff that's been proven not to work. You know, if, if an x-ray is fine, don't pay for the MRI. But, and for me, that's like, well, that's easy. Then I'm, I'm not decreasing quality, I'm not decreasing, and I'm reducing cost, I've won. Except there's people out there who are like, no, I want that MRI. And they see it as they just, they just got a loss. That their access has been impeded. And so, you know, one man's waste is another man's access. And so it's, someone will be upset. Someone will be, you know, someone will see it as rationing. Someone will see it. There is no easy solution that will just appeal to everybody where they won't, where they won't see it as a reduction in access. They won't see it as a reduction in quality. They won't see it as a reduction in cost. Um, if I was king, I could, I could make decisions that I think would reduce spending, not decrease the quality metrics that I think are important, and not decrease access in ways that I think matter but tons of people would disagree with me. And that's, that's where I think it gets in the weeds. Well, I come from, this, uh, from a little different perspective as a journalist who's written about healthcare for you know, 20, over 25 years. I'd first like to say, did, did any of you see 60 Minutes last night? The interview with the Donald? Okay. Well, there was one part on there where he talked about, you know, people, Leslie Stahl asked him if he was going to be bringing, you're bringing in lobbyists and whatever, and he said he was going to phase that out, so I, I do want to thank Jamie and the Texas Health Plan Association for inviting me to what I guess is their last meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so, I worked on that for about five minutes this morning. So, but I would like to say, as someone who covered the implementation of this law, which you all have got to sit back and take a deep breath, is that it took almost two years for the Affordable Care Act to become legislation that was signed by a president who had control of both Congress, including a 60 vote majority. And so one of the things that, as I listened to all the CEO earnings calls and the insurance companies and so forth, and there are things that, there's a lot of good things and a lot of things that are working in the law and personally, I think one of the smaller points, which is blown up into this whole political thing, is the actual expansion of healthcare coverage on the exchanges. Um, the move to value-based care, and the fact that 50% of Medicare reimbursement is going to be tied to value by 2018, there is no one on either side of the aisle that's going to get rid of that. Um, and I sort of think that Maybe they'll change the name, or maybe they'll do whatever, but if anybody really thinks that this is gonna go away on day one, that's crazy. And so I think that there, and you're also beginning to see sort of, uh, as far as the people that may or may not be in the administration, um, for you folks that deal with this, they're either gonna be devils or angels that you already know. Um, we're already hearing former Tommy Thompson people, former you know, Tom Scully, Sam. Not a lot, in my opinion, is going to change uh, right away. It's going to take some time. And the final thing I'll say before I pass it back to somebody else is, um, you sort of a, I'm from Iowa originally, sort of an Iowa-Texas analogy. is like, you know, when you drive down the road and you have the dog that chases the car, 
hoping he gets a hold of the bumper. The GOP has just got a hold of the bumper. So we'll see what happens now. Well, to follow that up, you know, 20 million Americans, you know, is the estimate the number of Americans that have gained coverage since the Affordable Care Act happened. And I think that's probably one of the number one concerns of a fast repeal of it is what do you do to transition for those 20 million Americans? And if you were going to provide advice to the Trump administration on, on how to create a transition or to address those Americans that are having coverage right now, what would you do? I'd like to start. Well, first of all, I dispute those numbers. Um, I think that uh, it's important to take into account the people who were previously insured, uh, particularly in the non-group market who are now on exchange-based or off-exchange-based ACA-compliant plans. Um, that's not always taken into account in, in those estimates. Um, but I would say that, in general, it's extremely important for any approach to, uh, you know, Republican approach to health reform to be very uh, mindful of disrupting coverage for the people who already have it. Uh, you, want, you want to minimize disruption to the, the, uh, the currently insured of whatever category, whether it's the newly insured or the people who were insured all along. Um, you know, that's the reason why President Obama or Senator Obama kept saying, if you like your plan, you can keep it. Uh, because he knew that there was political cost to saying otherwise, and he also knew that his plan wouldn't do that. So it was a, a frankly dishonest statement on his part to claim that his plan would allow everyone to keep their plans the way they were before. You can't introduce 20,000 pages of new federal regulations on how insurance plans can be designed and then insist that if you like your plan, you can keep it. But that was, that was premised, his comment, his statement was premised on the fact that there is a political cost to disrupting people's coverage. So that's something that everybody in Washington understands. And that's why, uh, as Aaron outlined in his earlier talk, one of the, the key elements to the repeal and replace approach is to create this two-year window where uh, you repeal the funding streams for the ACA via reconciliation, but give two years for, uh, for Congress to come up with a replace plan. And I should mention that, you know, uh, Aaron noted that, well, there's no consensus in the, in our, um, in the Republican, in Repub among Republicans in Congress as to how to go forward. That's natural for a congressional party. Um, what you're going to see, just as you saw with the ACA, is there's going to be, uh, if, if Republicans work to, to repeal and replace the ACA, there's going to be people in the Trump administration, most importantly the president, who will weigh in on this, particularly on the point about making sure that as many people as possible have health insurance. I think that's where the Trump administration will differ from the generic Republican. Um, the, the, the House will, uh, will obviously uh, be advocating the Paul Ryan approach, uh, and the Senate uh, will have its own approach that will be somewhere perhaps in between uh, where there, there have been plans that have been proposed in the Senate that maybe have not gotten as much attention as the Paul Ryan plan, but there was a plan put out by uh, Tom Coburn, Orrin Hatch, and Richard Burr, um, and, and Burr and Hatch are still in the Senate, Tom Coburn has, uh, has retired, that will, that will be uh, put back in play as well, that differ in important ways from the Paul Ryan approach. So there are gonna be three different groups, different, you know, entities, uh, institutions that are gonna be participating in the discussion. And the key is, okay, so you can repeal the funding streams of the ACA with 51 votes in the Senate, but to pass the replacement, a real robust replacement, it'll take 60 votes in the Senate. And so there will be a group of Democrats who will also have input into how the ACA is replaced. Now the Democrats won't have a veto over how to go forward because uh, if the funding stream expires in two years, Republicans have negotiating leverage to say, here's what we want to do. We want Democratic buy-in. We want this to be bipartisan, but we're not going to just like not do anything uh, if there's no cooperation because then everybody loses coverage. So I think I think they're going to be they're going to be those four groups of people or institutions that have uh, have input: the House, Republicans in the Senate, Democrats in the Senate, and the White House. And those four groups will haggle it out, and it won't look exactly like anything that anyone's drawn up on a piece of paper today. But the end result could be a, a system that's much better than the system we have today. And I think there's a lot of reason to be hopeful about that. My real concern is not the long-term replace so much as what could inadvertently happen to mess things up really bad in, in the short term. So my personal biggest fear is that they could repeal the funding for the cost sharing reductions. Now this is you know pretty nerdy stuff, but 
As an insurance company, we get subsidies from the federal government, the advanced premium tax credit. So actually in our case, we have about 90,000 people that we cover right now in the Houston area. About 75% of the revenue we get on those people are APTCs from, from the federal government. But the other thing that we get is about $40 million in cost sharing reductions for people who pick silver plans and they are below 250% of the federal poverty level. Dr. Carroll shaking his head. I, I, unless you're in this business the way we're in it, it's not, you know, most people don't understand it. But those cost sharing reductions which pay us back for the deductibles and the co-payments and the co-insurance that we waive for people in certain poverty levels, is enough to bankrupt us if we don't get that money and that could be easily done by the house and senate by saying we don't want to have another insurance company bailout the same way we got rid of the risk corridors which only cost us about four million dollars it wasn't a big issue for us but if they took away the cost sharing reductions it would just we would be, honestly we'd be bankrupt and i think that those kind of little nuances, it's not so much about us, but it's th those little things that don't seem like a big issue could really disrupt the market incredibly in, in the short term. Uh, if they did something weird with the uh, APTs themselves for a couple of years during the transition. So it really is very important that they like don't unintentionally screw something up really bad that would disrupt the market uh, before they come out with a replacement. That's what I worry about. Uh, so, just to add to what Ken described here, it's important to actually understand the context of this debate about cost sharing reduction. So, the debate is, you know, the executive branch, if, if cost sharing reductions are written into the ACA, the executive branch can't unilaterally decide not to do anything about them, right? The, pro the issue, the debate right now about this particular issue, uh, uh, provision is whether or not the ACA was drafted in a way to appropriate funding for the cost sharing reductions and the argument uh, among uh, by some on uh, on the conservative side and and that's been validated in the courts is that the ACA does not appropriate funds for the cost sharing reductions and that uh, the federal government CMS has been spending money illegally that was not appropriated by the taxpayers for that purpose so um, the reason why this is coming up right now is because there's a concern about the legality of uh, of these payments so um, while from a policy standpoint, we can have a debate about the value of cost sharing reductions, and I personally think that, uh, that cost sharing reductions of a form are very appropriate for a lower income people, um, I think we also have to understand the, the, the importance from a policy standpoint of the federal government spending money it's been authorized by Congress to spend and not money that it hasn't been authorized by Congress to spend. So, so I'll, I'll only add, I, I think this is, Exactly right. Um, don't get me wrong, but I, <clears throat> I think that the reading of the law can be nuanced, um, and that I don't profess to be an expert in the law. And there's a guy on our blog that I defer to much more when we're talking about, and he wrote about this just earlier in the week. So there's no question that there's debate about the legality of it. Of course, by the time you know you get to this level, you get to a certain point where, where usually what the Supreme Court does, if they finally rule on it, would say like you need to fix this with a legislative fix and we're gonna let you do it until you fix it. So I mean, there are ways around it, even getting around the legality part in order to make sure that everything does not collapse um, in the interim. But that shouldn't, that shouldn't remove the idea that there are ways to force a lot of the collapse. There are. Um, if, if that was the goal of the Trump administration to come in and make it collapse, there are ways to, to try to make that happen. My biggest fear, I think, moving forward, probably not my biggest fear, but I think what my likeliest to come true fear is that I think we may move forward with repeal before we get to replace, um, with the idea that we'll repeal with this two year window and then there'll be sort of a, a loaded gun that's gonna go off in two years. My fear part of that is the loaded gun will never go off. This will be like the doc fix 2.0. That as we, approach, as we approach the window every time, we will have a panic and the world will come to an end and Republicans and Democrats will stand off and no one is gonna know what's gonna happen and we'll have a countdown to when the whole thing is gonna collapse and at the last second we'll pass a six month or one year push down the line and we will do this over and over and over again, much as we did with the doc fix because it is so much easier to kick the can down the road than to try to marshal uh, you know, some sort of bipartisan or even sometimes one party approach that's gonna take all the flack and move forward. 
That will yield to massive uncertainty in all the healthcare industries that are affiliated with the law, uh, widespread panic, uh, each time that this is going to happen, what's going to happen to the people with bills, what's going to happen, and that's, that would be unfortunate for all. I'm a little more pessimistic, I think, than, than Ovik on the sense that the Congress is going to come together to fix this. Now, I may be wrong, um, but I don't think that, that there's as much support for, say, Paul Ryan's better way um, than, than, than Paul Ryan and, and a faction of, I think that there's still many, many Republicans who might not get on board with that. And I think that he'd have a hard time wrangling Democrats for that. Now, it doesn't mean that they can't come to a compromise, doesn't mean that they can't find another way forward, but I think it will be far easier to, to, to pass something like 3672 with this two-year window and a promise that we're going to fix it than to actually get that fix. And I'm not sure that the threat will force everyone to come to the table so much as for us to keep doing this over and over again as we move forward. Well. I just want to say, let's just step back a minute and realize what just happened. Okay, who was elected? Okay, does anybody really think that the, ne the president-elect is going to buy into a plan that was branded by somebody else? Mm -hmm. The better way? I, 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 there, there's just not going to happen. Um, so, but I would say you will be able to have plenty of time to transition to whatever, because I, you know, we're already talking about this person's plan, that person's plan, blah, 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 blah. Look, look back at history. That happened with Hillary Clinton, and nothing happened. This person, the McDermott plan, and that, but it, come on. I mean, it's going to take some time, and maybe there will be some changes, but I don't believe they're going to pull the rug out. These words like cripple and gut, and it, that is just not the way it, Washington works. And personally, and I'm not trying to make fun of him or anything, but the president-elect seems to be someone who was influenced by the last person he talked to. Um, Leslie Stahl last night, he has a meeting with President Obama, he comes out and he says that he's in favor of pre, you know, the pre-existing condition. Maybe he said that in the art of the deal, but he certainly didn't say that on the campaign trail. So he did, he did, I think, he did. great, so that's not what I remember. Um, but anyway, but I, I guess what I'm saying is, do you really think that within the first three months that they're going to repeal this and then they're going to leave us with nothing and then the whole market is going to collapse and whatever? I, I just don't see it. Um, but there are per certain areas of the country, I would say, that have had some problems on the exchanges. Arizona, a lot of rural areas where they don't have choices where you may see uh, some sort of action that I think is probably, from a Republican standpoint, and what they supported in the Bush years, um, will benefit the insurance industry and health plans because they want to get away from this idea of government trip control and they want to have more choice and more options for people by getting insurers back in the market. I, I do think they could repeal this with the two-year window with a promise to replace. I mean, because that's that's how they can do it and accomplish it and still not upend everything that is. I think it is, that's what that's what the, the bill that they've already passed does. It says like, we repeal this and in two years all of this is gonna happen, now go replace it. I, but will that achieve, but will that achieve the goal of we're gonna make it less expensive and it's going to be great. I think it can. And by the way, I should mention that um, you know we should not make the mistake of only looking backward when we talk about what Republicans will do going forward. Um, we've had a, eight years in which Republicans were the congressional party and the Democrats were the presidential party, um, and so that's perhaps lead us led us to forget that presidential leadership is very important on policy, especially on health care. Um, and I think that, uh, as uh, Bruce alluded to earlier, I don't think the president-elect is just going to sit there and say, Paul Ryan, do whatever you want. I, I don't care. Um, he stated uh, in the last couple of days that his top three priorities are um, border security, health care reform, and the economy, uh, jobs uh, for people who don't have them. I mean, that's, he's elevated health care pretty highly in, in terms of his, uh, his agenda, and I think he's going to insist on some of these priorities that, as I said, maybe congressional Republicans haven't cared about a lot. And, and the big difference, you know, so Aaron was talking about, well, I don't know if Paul Ryan is going to be able to get uh, the backbenchers in the House to go along with what he wants. 
Well, part of the reason why is that Paul Ryan doesn't have the stature to get those backbenchers to do what he wants, but Donald Trump does. Because Donald Trump is the guy who rallied the voters that elected them back to Congress. And so there's a lot going on that's gonna go on in the next couple of years in terms of the political dynamic intra-Republican that hasn't been the case in the past. And so I just guide everyone to keep that in mind. Remember, Nancy Pelosi did not write the Affordable Care Act as much as perhaps some people uh, might have wanted her to. It was a Senate Finance Committee uh, that wrote the Affordable Care Act. And one of the dirty secrets of that, by the way, is there were a number of Republican staffers for the Republican uh, minority members of the Senate Finance Committee who played a role in some of the t quirky provisions in the ACA that we all complain about now. Uh, so the point being that the reason why the Senate Finance Committee was so important is because that was where the tie would be broken. That was where the 60 votes were gonna occur to get something through. And I think here, you're gonna see the Senate play a much bigger role, and you're gonna see the White House play a much bigger role, and it's very important to go forward and do that. And by the way, on this point about pre-existing conditions, it is important to say, you know, I worked for two other uh, presidential candidates this cycle, uh, other than Donald Trump, and so it was my job to very closely monitor what Donald Trump was saying on policy when he would actually say things on policy. Uh, and he absolutely did say consistently, I could point you to the reference, there was a debate on February 25th, 2016, how's that for precision? Uh, in which uh, Donald Trump specifically said, I will repeal and replace Obamacare, but I will maintain coverage for people with pre-existing conditions. Uh, it's the modern age, and I think that we have to have that. And that's not the only time he said that, but that's the most explicit. So he has said this before. He has not said anything in the last three or four days that's been inconsistent with what he said on the trail. And again, I think the fact that he supported universal coverage is something that, for those who support universal coverage in this room, uh, you should all hold him accountable for, for that pledge and that, that priority. So I'm gonna shift us to the health insurance market. Uh, Bruce, you talked about the fact that, I guess with the ACA, we actually have had concerns and problems with the health insurance market and problems with stability. So there may be an opportunity there. At the same time, I think we've brought up some of the key elements that will you know, have a big impact on insurance companies. It's guaranteed issue, the pre-existing conditions, the subsidies, the cost sharing risk, and people, and we'll talk about trade-offs, people want to pick the fun parts, the, you know, the nice parts, and no one wants to have the mandate, you know, or pay, pay for the subsidies and the cost sharing reductions. So what do you really see happening with the market? Um, you know, what do you see insurance companies advocating for? You know, what do you see Republicans really, you know, caring about when it comes to the stability of health insurance? Well, I guess, I mean, I, like I say, I follow the insurance companies very closely and what they're doing. And um, what, let's just talk about what's worked. So you do have, believe it or not, in parts of the country, um, health insurance companies that did not get in in the first two years, and now they're getting in. And what is emerging all across the country, and how this will play legislatively, I'm not sure, but um, what is going on are, are narrow networks. Um, you know back to the value-based proposition. Iowa, for example, Wellmark, uh, which is the big Blue Cross plan, they were not in in the first couple of years, even as uh, they had a co-op collapse, United Healthcare leaves, they are going into half of Iowa's 99 counties, putting the providers at risk with two big healthcare systems there. Same thing in Chicago, uh, in Illinois, Healthcare Service Corporation, which owns the Texas Blues in, Texas, in Illinois, uh, formed a, a, a a plan, a low cost, narrow network plan with Advocate Healthcare, which is the largest provider in Illinois. Florida Blue, where Humana's getting out, Aetna's getting out, um, I think United's getting out. Um, they have 700,000 people on exchange. They knew the market better. So I think it comes down to, did you know your market better? Were you in the individual business before? Um, you, I, I tend to think that most of the folks that were in the individual business before are still in it. It's complicated, as you know. Some people who went in for a little while and then they're getting out. But I do think that the narrow network strategy and so forth, that seems to be where we're headed. Yeah, that, I think that's actually true long term that when you have more individuals who make choices about what insurance they're going to buy rather than employers making choices, that people will pick uh, narrower networks and also will pick often to have less coverage. Uh, so those will be interesting trends. The short term uh, challenge will, will continue to be that no, none of us really have figured out what the risk is yet. We have 
so many people moving around and moving between carriers now, and also, at least in Texas, more and more people uh, signing up for coverage that were uninsured before, knowing how sick these people are, what the risks uh, that you're actually taking on, what the age of the population is, it is very difficult. And you know, Congress didn't help us any by messing up the three R's, and CMS didn't help us by having the risk adjustment be un understandable to even those of us who thought we understood uh, risk adjustments. So it, it's still a very volatile uh, market right now, and the uncertainty of the presidential election just adds to that. So it's, it's you know, every carrier is gonna do what's in uh, their own uh, interest. I think some of us uh, that are coming at it from the Medicaid space continue to kind of feel like we're accustomed to no pre-existing conditions. That's how Medicaid works. Uh, we're uh, accustomed to having sort of the rate dictated to us by the marketplace as opposed to us setting the rates ourselves. And so uh, I think it's going to continue to be very interesting to see how uh, companies like Community Health Choice and others that have been in the Medicaid space, how Centene and Molina and some of those fare compared to uh, to some of the other plans that, that haven't been in, or that were in an individual space in a very, very different environment that we're in now. And, and I guess to expand on that for both of you, is there a way for the market, you know, to stabilize or be stable in a situation where they've decided to keep guaranteed issue with community rating, but not necessarily deal with the personal accountability piece, which was the, the individual mandate? You know, is there a path there? Because that, you know, that appears to be, people want those two things, but the uncertainty is how do you have a market where people don't have to sign up until they're sick? Well, I mean, there, there were always other options besides, besides a mandate. Um, you know, there, I mean, even then they put forward right now the idea that, you know, we'll cover people who are, con who are previously eligible, and as long as you maintain continuous eligibility, or as long as you maintain insurance coverage, sorry, coverage, then you would, you would continue to get benefit from the regulations. There are, ways to do it with, with periods of time, sort of the penalty box, where you know you cannot buy insurance, you would be individually rated for a period of time until until you would get the community rating. So sort of to, to, to try to say, well, insurance will cost you more at the beginning, and that would be the driver uh, by which you would, you would try to get people to buy into insurance while they're healthy. Um, there are plenty of options. This was the one that, that the Democrats chose when when they enacted the law, and there are other countries that do it do it very differently as well. So there are ways. I mean, it's not that there are not options. The, the important part is trying to pick the one or pick one that we think would, would work best and, and try to, to reduce the, the, the downside trade-offs or the, the problems we would want to see. Aaron, in his uh, slides, uh, mentioned the three-legged stool. I'm sure that's a, a metaphor that all of you have heard before. Um, now, imagine a three-legged stool in which the three legs of the stool are of different lengths and at different angles to the ground. Now imagine, ask yourself this, would you want to sit on such a stool? Uh, and the reason I ask that is because this three-legged stool concept was kind of a way to suspend critical thought about how the ACA was designed. Because if you're going to have a three-legged stool, that three-legged stool is only something you're going to want to sit on if every leg of the stool is carefully calibrated so they're all the same length and the same angle to the ground. And this was the problem with the ACA, is that you had one leg, the leg with all the regulations and the adverse selection, that was really, really long, right? Three to one age rating, the EHBs, the actuarial value mandates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then you had uh, the individual mandate, which was caps out at $695 a year or 2% of your adjusted gross income, which is pretty small for most low-income people relative to the cost of insurance under the ACA. And it also, by the way, has enormous amounts of loopholes, right? There's a loophole for any serious life change. Uh, you're actually exempted if your income is at a certain proportion to the premiums. Uh, people under 138% of poverty are exempted. So the number of people who are actually, uh, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, let's have a mandate to force people to buy insurance. but the scale of the penalty for not buying insurance matters, and the number of people the penalty actually applies to matters, right? So that was a short leg of the stool, a very weak mandate. And then, on the other side, you had these um, subsidies, right? And the subsidies themselves were, were not always well constructed to deal with the fact that you had a lot of people who were paying a lot more for premiums, even if you take the subsidies into account. So the subsidies were not large enough to offset the massive increase in the gross premium costs on the ACA. 
So, so the key is you can do a lot of things to engineer a better, well-functioning, robust, non-group market for health coverage, uh, but you have to balance out the adverse selection with the, the enroll, late enrollment penalties or mandates or auto-enroll or whatever mechanism you want to use and the subsidy. That can absolutely be done and a more skillfully designed uh, a bill could accomplish that. Then I, I respond only that I, there's nothing in that that I disagree with and no one should take the three-legged stool to be some sort of blanket defense of the ACA and to say it was perfect. Um, it's the idea, the stool is the idea that we want regulations which are going to provide community rating and guaranteed issue. To avoid that, we have to make sure that the market doesn't incentivize healthy people to opt out or, come, or, or cause adverse selection. And if you accomplish that, you need to subsidize in some way. Uh, there are lots of ways to do that. Um, and the ACA is not doing it optimally. It's just, you know, there are th absolutely things that need to be improved. I think the mandate is weak. Um, and if we aren't gonna tolerate a stronger mandate, we need to do something else in order to overcome the purely rational idea that healthy people would try to opt out of the market. Um, this is not to say that the ACA is the only way to, to prop up that stool. That the ACA, so I mean, yeah, I agree. It's not a great, it, the stool could be better. Um, but the idea behind reform, the, the theories that, that underlie the idea that this is the way we can try to use a private insurance system to create a universal healthcare system, that usually, that is sort of well described, I think, by the stool. Uh, and by the ideas that, that we have to try to come up with ways to do that. Can we do it a different way that's perhaps better? Absolutely. Um, but, I, but I don't think that removes any of the thing that we still probably need all three of those things in some way. And any other replacement for those will be also difficult to get calibrated correctly as well. We may not have a good calibration to start with, but replacing those is also going to be, be challenging. I, I mean, you know, legislation is always difficult, but I think uh, there are more optimal and smarter and more robust ways to do, uh, to, to, re, to recalibrate the, the non-group market in the way we have now. The thing we remember is like, what's the real goal, right? Let's just step back from all this technical stuff. What's the real goal? The real goal is to make sure that the people for whom health insurance is expensive today can afford it in the future, okay? So there are a lot of different ways to do that. You can do it the regulatory way, which is the ACA way. Force insurers to design plans that over-insure the healthy and insure adequately perhaps the sick and the elderly, uh, etc. That's one way to do it, but that creates a lot of adverse selection. There's another way to do it, which is to be, again, minimally prescriptive at the federal level, but provide financial assistance in the form of direct tax credits to the people who need the help affording coverage. So you don't have to have, for example, a three-to-one age band. You can have, a, have no age band at all, let insurers freely price their products based on the actuarial risk of someone at a particular age point, and then say, look, if you're 57 years old and you're poor and your premium's gonna be $5,000 a year or $10,000 a year, we'll make sure you have the direct financial assistance to make sure that you can afford health coverage, instead of making young people in the risk pool pay a lot more for health insurance, which of course incentivizes them to drop out, right? So this idea that the only way to do it is by regulating the market to force young and healthy people to pay more for insurance is not true. There are other ways to do it that minimize the adverse selection, but still ensure that people who need to afford health insurance and have trouble doing so can do so. I think we're gonna open it up to a few audience questions, if anyone has any questions. Just warning panel, I'm from California, so I think different. Uh, <laughs> not really originally, but anyhow, as we've been talking about all these things, and you mentioned about the lack of physicians, part of the ACA and all that came with it are things like all the regulations, bundle payments now that we're looking at, that, that kind of followed it, uh, reporting requirements that are beyond anything else. And the health plans always suffer before that because they have to go in and try to figure out what the providers are going to do to be able to provide the services that they need to have provided for their members. Anybody have any idea of what might happen with some of these things that CMS has been floating out there? Well, I, mean, I, I would say that, you know, 
It's a great question because I think so much of the political discourse has been focused in on the Obamacare, you know, the, the uh, exchanges and so forth. I don't think, I think that there is, if you look at the macro law, you know, that was passed by Republican Congress and signed into law by uh, President Obama. You know, that was all lots of regulation, lots of quality measures, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot of that in the Affordable Care Act. I don't think that's going to go away. Um, there may be certain lobbies that get in there. The hospice group may say, we don't want to do this, and getting somebody's here, maybe it'll go away. I don't think that's going to go away. Um, I would, one thing I do want to say before, I, if I don't have an opportunity, you know, the providers need to, have, there needs to be a better way to educate them on what's going on, as well as the patients. And that's one thing I'm passionate about, is to you know, explain this to people so they understand it. And the Physicians Foundation, which does a big survey every year, said only 20% of physicians were even familiar with MACRA. I mean, this is gonna rock their world. So, but bottom line is, I don't think a lot of that's gonna go away. Yeah, I, I keep thinking that one of the best things that might happen with the, with the new presidential administration is looking at some of the regulation that has come out for Medicaid managed care and for uh, physicians and, and hospitals and all the rest because we need to control costs on a, on a macro level and the, and the real problem is is that continuing increase and in, in my desire to see if there's ways to bend trend going forward and part of it is that we do have over regulation of not just the insurance industry but the physicians and the hospitals and all the rest too and I'm hoping that we can find the right balance of what are the quality metrics that really matter that we can move the metric on at the same time that we can figure out ways to have more uh, efficiency in, in care so that physicians and hospitals can have a decent margin and maybe bundled payments will, will work. We're making a big bet on um, bundled payments in maternity right now because we're such a big carrier uh, for that. Hopefully there's gonna be some things that will start bending trend because in the end insurance premiums are gonna be a, we'll figure out about the issues in the insurance market about if there's a mandate or not or how strong the mandate is or what the required essential services but in the end it's the medical services themselves in terms of how much we spend in the United States how much we pay for these services that's ultimately going to drive long-term uh, health insurance costs and so that's the part that I keep thinking is we need to be focusing more and more on what's the right balance of regulation and market forces in health health care services, not health insurance premiums. So regulation's a big word, and so it's like, you know, what, what, which, which exactly thing would be changed? There are lots of things which are just dictated, as I said before, by HHS and, and CMS that are just part of the executive branch. I mean, the executive branch sort of gives the term, and so those things, I'm sure President Trump's gonna put new people in charge, and they will have new marching orders, and those things can change, but on the other hand, things that are under MACRA are not without a change in the law. That I don't see happening anytime soon. Things that are part of the Affordable Care Act would, would be changed with a repeal and replace law, um, not necessarily just a repeal law, because they unlikely can't be done in reconciliation. Um, and so I would think a lot of the things that doctors are complaining about with respect to reporting and quality metrics, that is not, that is macro, um, and that, that's gonna happen. The stuff that is just straight to CMS, I still don't see that's where they're going. I do think some of the things that are funded, like CMMI, theoretically PCORI, um, and other things, they, they, I don't know if that'll continue, um, because that is more under the discretion, I think, of, of how you know, Congress has to reauthorize it, or President Trump and the CMS has to keep pushing that forward. I don't know if that's gonna happen. Uh, but, but I think a lot of the things that the doctors and hospitals and all the stuff that they have to do in reporting and things like that, I don't see that changing very much in the near future. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. uh, just make one point about MACRA. Uh, MACRA was passed uh, in, in bi with big bipartisan majorities uh, because the AMA and a lot of people who support the AMA's position were really concerned about Medicare reimbursement rates for physicians um, and and so uh, that law was passed. And that law, by the way, increased the national debt by half a trillion dollars. Half a trillion dollars. So it's really great that doctors can make a little more money now 
for half a trillion dollars in additional national debt, and the strings that were attached to that half a trillion dollars was macro. So I appreciate that doctors are unhappy with macro, but maybe physicians should have thought of that before asking the federal government to spend another half a trillion dollars uh, on reimbursement rates. And I'm not saying that the reimbursement rates were the right ones before or after, and et cetera, but these are the policy trade-offs that happen, is if you're depending on the government to pay your bills, the government is going to add strings to how those bills uh, are get paid, and macro is the result. I think we have time for one more quick question. Good morning. Thank you all. You all have done a wonderful job. Very thought-provoking. Dr. Carroll, in your presentation, you talked about the fact that we spent more money per capita with really no better outcomes, and in many cases, less than our counterparts across the world. And yet, I think that's still the trend today as we are this many years into ACA. What is the silver bullet, or is there one? I mean, have we figured it out? And what can we do as uh, assistance to, to help move that needle because I really think that's where we're gonna have to go right is change the change that cost curve well it's important to remember that the Affordable Care Act first and foremost was about access that was what it was and it was the trade-off was they were willing to spend believe the budgetary gimmicks or not about a trillion dollars over the first decade in order to improve that access um, that was that's the ACA now then people will say oh yes but there's all these things that are going to contain costs and reduce spending in the future and that's when I roll my eyes even four or five years ago and say maybe you know but that was not that it was access that was that was that was what it was really meant to do um, improving access is ironically enough easy the easiest probably thing to do um, we can just spend money you know if we're willing to do it reducing costs is hard improving quality is unbelievably difficult um, and probably I can't fathom how we can easily do it at sort of a federal level um, because Quality is so much of boots in the ground, what's wrong in my local area, my local hospital, what are the issues in my local population, you know, trying to figure it out. We try to accomplish some things with public health and saying how can we improve the health of the nation as a whole, but you know, when we really get down to like how am I gonna improve quality, I don't know that there's an easy federal lever. I mean, that, I think that that almost has to be done um, at a local level. By, by trying to figure out what are the real problems locally, what's the rate limiting step, what can we do to improve care, how do we improve the health of our population, uh, you know, what makes it different than, than someone else. You know, it's a, as, a, as a, I'm a pediatrician, I try to fix the patients that are right in front of me. Um, and their needs are very specific. Um, and their needs are very different than my wife works, she's a nurse practitioner, she runs a, a teen clinic in an inner city school. And her, the, their needs are completely different than the children I see in my clinic. And when I talk about improving the quality of care for my patients, that looks vastly different than what she's talking about um, when she talks for hers. But, but we don't talk about quality. I mean, we're, this is when I, I get frustrated in that we're still screaming and yelling, perhaps as we should, about how do we improve access and how do we get a handle on cost. We almost never have a, a real dialogue on, on how do we improve quality unless it's like, what's the newest procedure, what's the newest drug, or, or what are we gonna do? But I don't know that that'll happen at Congress or even, man, I guess it could happen in the executive branch. I don't necessarily see it happening in Congress through legislation, um, but I would love to see a national focus. You know, uh, one thing I should mention is we, we do actually have, in, in certain ways, uh, there are aspects of the US healthcare system that are good. Um, you know, take, take a length of hospital stay, for example. The average length of stay in a US hospital is about a day and a half shorter than it is in the typical advanced economy. Now, never mind that the average day in the hospital costs five times as much as the average day in, say, a European or Canadian or Japanese hospital, uh, but that has to do with high prices, not so much even volume or utilization, it's prices uh, that are, it's the fact that an MRI costs six times as much here than it does in other countries. It's not actually that we're overloading people with too much care or unnecessary care that that's a problem. We actually do a much better job than a lot of other countries on a lot of these metrics. Uh, but the reason we don't have a high quality healthcare system and the, the biggest thing that's lacking is that we don't have a patient-centered healthcare system. Why don't we have a patient-centered healthcare system? Because the patients don't control the dollars. We have not only third-party payment for care because all of you nice people uh, run, uh, work for insurance companies that pay the claims, 
But people don't actually choose their own insurance plans, with the exception of the people in the non-group market and the occasional MAA and, you know, et cetera, private exchange. The vast majority of people basically get the plan that their employer or the government has chosen for them. Uh, and so we have third-party payment of third-party payment of health care. In other words, we have ninth-party health care. Is it any surprise that patients are totally divorced from the value and quality of the care they receive? I promise you, if patients were controlling those health care dollars instead of the government and the insurance companies and the employers, uh, we would have a much better quality health care system because patients would not put up with a lot of the stuff they routinely put up with in waiting rooms uh, today, for example. So, um, not to say that insurance companies don't have a very, very important role. They absolutely do. You all absolutely do. But the more patients are choosing to hire you instead of having that choice being done by someone else, the quality and satisfaction is going to be a lot higher. When patients are choosing the doctor in the hospital they go to, the quality and satisfaction will be higher because they're going to hold providers accountable. And the more we can move to that kind of system, the better. I think that's a great way to close our panel. I want to thank all of you for being here today. It was like a really great discussion. We're about to have lunch in the Venetian Ballroom, and we're going to be coming back in here later at 1250 for Matthew Dowd. So once again, I'd like to give a strong welcome and applause to our panel this morning.